All right. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for taking the time to listen to this webinar. We're going to be talking about backup and recovery for Linux using Amazon S3. So we have a number of topics to cover today. I'm going to be moving fairly quickly. We're going to take a look at today's backup challenges. We'll justify the use of Amazon S3 for backup. We're going to take a look at a number of uh, issues around backup, storage, and recovery in a fair amount of detail. And then we're going to review options for both on-premises and cloud-based backup. My goal is to give you enough information to let you get started doing backup to S3 today. And I also want to make sure that we have time at the end to address your questions. So what are some of the challenges inherent in doing backup today? I found a neat article online, and it outlines some of the interesting things that, that you have to worry about if you're doing backup. Uh, cheaper hardware has led to a proliferation of stored data. Abundant bandwidth has made it easier and easier to move that data around and has led to the, the accumulation of even more data. The paperless business has led to organizations storing more and more information online, as has the growth of automated data collection, such as little devices and sensors all in all different places that are, are simply logging and collecting data, putting it safely away in, for eventual analysis. This then leads into the whole topic of big data, where, where gigabytes and terabytes of data are, are collected, analyzed, and processed. As businesses grow larger and, and become worldwide in scope, certainly we see the, the strategic importance of data continuing to grow. And we also see uh, issues around regulatory requirements, where, where in certain businesses you are simply required to keep various types of data around either indefinitely or for defined periods of time. So let's take a look at Amazon S3. You probably know just a little bit about S3 already, so I want to cover some of the, the more important details of S3 to kind of justify it for backup. Primary features of S3 that make it well suited to backup include the fact that it is off-site storage as a service. Intrinsically, S3 is fully redundant, so you don't have to worry about making multiple copies of your data. By simply uploading it to S3, you are ensuring that redundancy. Within S3, data is stored on multiple devices in multiple facilities. S3 is designed for 11 nines of durability and 4 nines of availability. And very importantly, S3 is available in all eight of the AWS regions, and this gives you full control over data residency. You get to decide exactly where your data is stored, and you, you always choose a particular region for that. Over the six years that S3 has been around, we have dropped prices on it multiple times. And a, a good way to think about this that's unique as compared to owning your own storage devices is the fact that as we do lower the prices, the prices for your data you've already stored will also decline. Some additional features of S3 that you'll find that make it very attractive for backup include easy to enable server-side encryption, the ability for you to transfer data from your your existing location to S3 through an encrypted SSL connection, the ability for you to use ACLs, access control lists, to regulate access to your data, and some other advanced features such as object expiration, so you can tell S3 how long you'd like to retain individual objects, access logging, so you can see every get and every put of data in a particular S3 bucket, all of the standard physical security features of of AWS that we've outlined in previous webinars in our security white paper, and also location control, as I outlined previously, the idea that you have eight separate S3 locations, and you can choose exactly which one of those you would like to use to store your data. A few other final reasons. S3's pay-as-you-go model means that you're not going to have any sticker shock. Your cost will scale directly with usage. You don't have to buy expensive hardware, and you don't have to pay for hardware in, in large kind of uh, stair-step increments. You simply keep storing data in S3. And in fact, because of the tiered pricing model for S3, your, your effective price per gigabyte will continue to go down as you store more and more data. S3 has seen broad industry acceptance. As of the end of 2011, we have over 762 billion objects stored there. And then, as we'll talk about later, Many third-party tools and applications are available that were either adapted to or custom-built to store data into S3. 
Let's go into some of the challenges of backup storage and recovery in more depth. As I started thinking about this webinar, I realized there are many, many things to think about. There are backup considerations, storage considerations, and also recovery considerations. When you start to think about backing up, what do you need to back up? Are they files? Are they databases? Must you back up all of the files and databases you have, or can you be more selective? Do you do full backups where you're always filling up, you're copying all of your data fresh each time, or you can you do periodic full backups and then in between those do incremental backups to simply update the changed information? How frequently? Is this daily, weekly, monthly? How much data do you need to back up? What is the annual growth rate in the amount of data that you have stored? Then you have to start thinking about things. How long is it going to actually take me to do a backup run? How do I deal with the fact that data might be changing underneath me, the data consistency issue, as we run the backup? If you have a business that's online 24-7, do you actually have a backup window where there's a quiet time where you can safely do a backup? Or do you need to do backups live while your system is, is up and running and being accessed? Traditionally, you need to think about hardware, your, in particular, your backup device. You need to think about how much that device is going to cost you. It is a, a mechanical device with a number of moving parts, so it's going to have a, a defined useful life. Because of that, you need to ha have to think about having a at least one spare device. Perhaps you need to have a primary and a backup device for each facility. In addition to the cost of the backup device, you're going to need to think about the cost per gigabyte of the actual backup medium that you use. Once you've made those backups, you need to think about where you're going to put them. If you store those backups on site, you're going to have to worry about what if some disaster strikes your, your local data center. If you're going to have some sort of off-site storage for those backups, you have to think about the, the cost involved in that. You're going to have to think about how long you keep these backups around. If, if you have a large amount of data, you're going to start to accumulate backup tapes. Perhaps you're going to run into some limitations as your physical storage capabilities uh, allow. And you also have to think about the fact that, that magnetic media, especially tapes, is very, very prone to deterioration over time. Finally, if you're thinking about off-site, you need to think about what it's going to take to retrieve that data. It's wonderful to think about taking your data and putting it in, in the middle of a, of a mountain or a mine somewhere far, far away. But you need to think about the, the physical, real-world latency of being able to get that data back from that safe but somewhat inaccessible location. And then if you're backing up lots of data, you need to think about organizing and cataloging. You're going to start putting potentially millions of files on every backup tape. You're going to have a proliferation of backup types. Let's say you do need a particular file or an entire device worth of, uh, of data to restore. How do you find the right one? Did you actually store the right data on there? When did you store it? When did that data expire? So let's say we're going to go ahead and do a retrieval. Which of the backup tapes do you need? How long is it going to take you to retrieve this if it was stored off-site. What if you make a request to your, your local storage facility or remote storage facility, and they say, we actually can't locate that physical uh, piece of, uh, piece of uh, information. Suppose you get it back, and it turns out that the, you, you thought you were doing high-quality backups, but either due to media deterioration or to an, an imperfect backup process, perhaps your, your data is, is corrupt. And then finally, what is the actual expected time to, to transfer the data back from, from the device onto your, your local hard drive and actually be back up and running and fully recovered? So as you can see, when you start to think about backup, storage, and retrieval, there are just a huge number of different options to, to think about. Once we start storing the data, we need to think about expiration and rotation. How long do we want to retain the backups? What do we do when, when the old backup tapes expire? Do we destroy them? Do we discard them? Do we overwrite them? If we're overwriting them and we have a rotation plan in place, 
at some point they're going to become too old to, to be useful because may, perhaps they're going to start to see some physical wear and tear. At that point, you must realize you have valuable data stored on, on those old backup tapes. How do you safely and securely d dispose of those so that they, the data doesn't end up in a, a place where it does not belong? And then we come to financial considerations. How much is it actually worth to keep your business up and running? What was the cost to obtain that data, build up those databases, and what is the business value of the data? If you have some kind of a black swan event and you do have a failure, what is the cost to your business in dollars per minute, let's say, in downtime? What is it going to be your, your cost to store your data? And when you might want to think about that in, in a cost per gigabyte. Once again, the cost of your devices, how many do you need? And then after we go through all these considerations, what are the operational and personnel costs that, that come into play here? So as you can see, lots and lots of different things to think about. So let's start to, to dive a little bit deeper. And be, before we do that, I want to go, go super, super deep on this and make sure that there, there's one really important technical aspect that comes into play quite often here. We should cover up front. The, the first is that it's going to turn out that files and databases often require distinct backup strategies. With files, you have many, many objects that are of variable size. They're often date-stamped objects, which gives you the ability to do incremental backups or the ability to simply, from a, a given starting point, backup only the, the changed files. When you are processing and backing up files, you do have a really uh, important issue where at any given time, you have some programs reading and writing the data. These programs are going to have some open files. There is a consistency issue that means at some point, the program might be writing a sequence of objects to a file. If you take the backup at the wrong moment, perhaps two pieces of data that depend on each other for, for consistency, maybe the first one has been written, the second one is in a, a local buffer but hasn't yet actually been sent to the, the file. So there are some consistency issues and we'll talk about ways to address that in a little bit. Databases, on the other hand, are generally very large and often monolithic objects that we would back up. And similar to files, we have to worry about things such as open transactions, where we, we begin a transaction, we are writing a, a large number of items to a database. But until we close out that transaction, those items are not permanently stored in the database. Perhaps there are, are locks involved, and we're, we're, we're locking tables or locking rows in the database. If we suspend operations to the database, and we attempt to do a backup at that point, timeouts might actually fire because the, the, we expected these transactions and these operations to take far shorter amounts of time than they would happen when we are doing a, a backup. And, and then if we're thinking about doing whole device backup and we, we have a, a RAID-based file system, we need to think about the idea of backing up at the logical level, meaning that we're backing up the file system versus backing up at the physical level, backing up each of the devices that, that comprise that file system. If we're going at the physical level of a RAID system, again, we have a, a very, very uh, crucial consistency issue. We need to make sure that we, we stop all writes to that system, we synchronize all the data to disk, that we effect effectively in parallel, we want to take backups of all those physical RAID devices, we want to timestamp and catalog them so that if we do need to recover that backed up RAID system, that we bring back all the snapshots that were taken at the same time to guarantee logical consistency of the data. So as you can tell from what I just told you, logical consistency is, is simply a must. There's a number of, of different models, but they all come down to the this, this same basic operational model. We need to sync all of our in-memory data to disk. We need to freeze our database or our file system. For example, on Linux, there's a command called fsfreeze that will suspend write operations to the, the, a particular file system. If we're using a database, we might, for example, use MySQL stop and actually stop the database in order to prevent it from writing to the disk. We're then going to run the backup. We're going to unfreeze our database and or our file system and will continue. In most cases, running that backup is going to take some, some non-trivial amount of time, you know, minutes, 
up to maybe an hour or, or larger, given you know, depending on how much data you have. So we need to think about uh, about what might be happening while while your system is offline. You might need to think about, let's say, the database doesn't run properly. We need to still unfreeze and uh, and continue from there. Let's take a, a look at a number of different ways that we can back up. We can go. First, let's talk about on-premises to cloud backup architectures. And when I was putting my presentation together, I, I tried to review a number of different approaches and to identify a number of, of both open source and commercial tools to do this. In the interest of space and time, I, I couldn't cover every last possible tool. I, I certainly expect over time to, to grow, grow the list of, of what it is that we can talk about backup-wise. So the, the four main architectures that I saw were the, the transparent model, the archive and upload model, the backup tools model, and then several backup as a service models as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at each of these in turn. With the transparent backup model, it's effectively file sharing. What we're doing is we have a shared file system that is shared between your, your Linux system that would be either local on your desktop or in your data center, and some cloud-based storage. When you make a local change, those local changes are noticed by the shared file system and then directly uploaded or mirrored to the cloud. One advantage here is that this system simply just works. You don't have to think about periodic backups. You don't need scheduling. You simply proceed with regular operations. You save your information locally and then you mirror that information up to the cloud. So how do we go about doing that? One well-known application to do this is, is Dropbox. With Dropbox, the master copies of all your files are stored in S3. And to use Dropbox to, to back up your Linux systems, you simply install the Linux client, either on-premises or on your, your cloud-based server. To back up files, you're simply copying them to your, your Dropbox directory on your local system. When you do that, Dropbox will notice this and will, will then copy your, your files up to the, the master copy in S3. And will also mirror them to all the other systems where you have that same file shared into Dropbox. To recover, you're simply going to copy the files from that Dropbox directory back to your, your local file system. Another way to create a transparent file system is to use an, a product called S3 Fuse. In technical terms, this is what's called a user space file system. And you, you would run this on, on your Linux system. It actually runs as a regular user space application, so you don't need to install any kernel modifications or anything like that. When you configure and start to run S3 Fuse, it creates this file system for you. You can create it at any mount point you'd like in your directory tree. You store your files locally, and then they're automatically uploaded to the S3 bucket that you designate. So just like Dropbox, you don't need to make any changes to your application. You simply store the files in a particular location, and then the S3 Fuse system will take care of getting those the files up to S3. As part of my preparation here, I tried to use as many of the different tools and products that I talk about as possible. So I, I configured and actually ran S3 Fuse. Turned out to be really simple and straightforward. I downloaded the code and compiled it. I, can, I put my AWS credentials into a password file and set the permissions on that password file. Once I had done that, I created a mount point, which I called slash S3. And then I simply launched S3FS. The first argument to that command is the name of the S3 bucket within my account that I would like to to use as the, the cloud recipient of my data. And the second one is simply the mount point that I would like S3FS to, to use as the starting point for data storage. Once I've, I've done this, I can simply copy files into sl the slash S3 tree. When I do that, S3 Fuse will automatically copy that data into S3. Here is a view after I've actually done that. On the left, you can see the AWS Management Console. You can see that my, my jbar-s3fs bucket is selected. And you can see that there are a number of objects in there. And on the right, you can see the shell from my local Linux server where I copied those files from 
from the Linux server into the slash s3 fs directory. The next option for you is going to be the, the archiving and uploading model. With this model, you use existing local tools to create a file archive on the local machine. So I'm kind of old school Linux, so things like tar and CPIO and so forth are the, the commands I'm very familiar with to create these local archives. When you do this, you of course must have sufficient local free space to hold the, the archive before you upload it. Once you have created this archive, you're going to upload it to S3, and then you're going to, over time, you're going to want to manage that archive in S3. You're going to want to expire old, old files and so forth to make sure you have the, just as many backups around as you need. So let's take a look at an example of how we do this. Now, this is probably the, the, the least overhead, the, the simplest way as far as if, if you're comfortable at the Linux command line, nothing to buy. You can do all of this with, with simply things that you already have or you can easily download. You need the tar command, which you almost certainly already have installed on your machine. And you need S3 curl, which is a free download from the AWS site. S3 curl is just a simple wrapper around the curl utility that you probably know about already. It takes care of, of um, authenticating your request before you make the actual request to S3 and provides some built-in commands to make it a little bit easier to push data to S3. When you set up S3 curl, you can supply your ADIS credentials in the command line, or you can put those in a configuration file. Your choice for how you'd like to do it. Step one, of course, you're going to use your, your trusty old tar command to create an archive. In this create case, I went to my server. I backed up my public HTML directory to a file called backup public HTML 2012.03.28.tar. I, I didn't even specify any particular compression options in there because I wanted to keep this as clean and simple and straightforward as possible. Once I have done that, I can then run the S3 curl command to upload that archive to S3. Again, very, very simple and straightforward uh, command. We run S3 curl. We supply it with, a, with our AWS uh, ID and our secret key. We tell it that we want to put a particular local file, in this case, the backup file that I just created. Then, um, very, very importantly here, if you're going to be running this command, you'll see two dashes before the put. So th those two dashes specify that it's a, a Linux command line argument in the usual way. The next set of two dashes are used to separate the, essentially the first half of the arguments of the curl command from the second half. So there's actually a space after that second pair of dashes. So after that second pair of dashes, we simply have a destination in S3. So I, I simply point to s3.amazonaws.com. I point to my Jeff bar dash backup bucket. And then I give the, the final part of the key is where I would like that file to end up when it's uploaded to S3. So create the archive and upload to S3. Um, we're, we're showing this running from the command line. If you're going to be doing this in production, you'd almost certainly automate it and put it in a, a cron script. So I run my S3 curl command, and the file is going to upload to S3. Um, because this is using curl in the background, it gives you a nice status report as the file is uploading. For production use, and the way I have this arranged on several of my own systems, I run the tar and I run the upload from a cron with, with several different levels of error checking in there as well to make sure that I've properly created the archive and I've properly uploaded it to S3. So here's the final um, result of that. I go to my Jeff Bar backup on my console, and I can see that that file was successfully uploaded to S3. Once I have that file in S3, there's, there's a couple of, of really simple to enable options that, that I thought were worth pointing out to you. The first is I can select the file in the console. I can go down to the properties at the bottom of the page, and I can enable server-side encryption. So in here, I simply checked AES-256, and S3 will, will do server-side encryption of that file. It will automatically manage my keys for me. So j just that one simple checking of that option was all it took to encrypt the backup file. Since I'm going to be running this backup every day, I certainly don't want to accumulate an infinite number of backup files. So I simply went to the lifecycle tab of the bucket properties, not the object properties, but the entire bucket. And I, in that lifecycle tab, 
I specify a prefix. So here I'm saying that any file that has a name starting with backup, I would like S3 to expire and delete it when that file is older than 45 days. So here I've taken care of, of two operations that are, are generally things that would be of concern to you when you backup, keeping your data safe and secure and getting rid of old files. Both of those are simply checkbox options in the S3 console. This example looked really, really simple and clean, but as I thought about it, I realized you, you get an awful lot as basically intrinsic properties of the backup. I backed up about 300 megabytes in, in that one backup, but I can store as much as I want. I never hit any particular kind of a wall where I say, well, it's, it's too much data, S3 can't hold it. I can store that data for as long as, as I'd like. Uh, there, there's no reason at all that I need to ever think about deleting that file other than the fact that I don't need it anymore. That simple pair of commands gave me 11 nines of durability for that data. And I'm paying only for the amount of data that I store. So, so given that it costs 12 and a half cents per gigabyte month to store data in S3, that file is gonna cost me a grand total of, of four cents per month. P pretty low cost to have, have that security of having my data backed up. As you saw, the data is encrypted. I turned on automatic expiration and then all the tooling was free. We used the tar command, we used the S3 curl command, didn't have to buy anything, didn't have to pay for anything. Once that data is, is backed up, I can restore it, restore it to my on-premises server, or I can restore it to a cloud-based server. So simple, simple backup, but a number of really important attributes that I thought were worth pointing out to you. There are also a number of commercial backup tools. In, in fact, there were too many different tools for me to really give all of them justice in, in this presentation. I'll just point out one to you here. Um, the company is Zimanda. Their product is called Amanda Enterprise. And the way this works is that you run a number of different backup agents on your different client machines, that are either on-premises or in the cloud. The, the Amanda Enterprise server that runs on a, one, a single server within, within your um, organization coordinates the action of, of all these client apps and then manages the backup from local up to Amazon S3. You can learn more about that at zmanda.com. There are also some organizations offering backup as a service. For example, tarsnap.com will encrypt your data before uploading. And their storage is, uh, they have kind of a, a humorous model here. Their pricing model is 300 pico dollars per byte per month, which, which works out to 30 cents per gigabyte per month. So they encrypt the data before it leaves your local machine. They give you a, a client-side application that, that's very, very similar to the tar command that you know and already use. And very, very simple to sign up for a tarsnap account, download and install the, the tarsnap command, and start backing up to the cloud. Again, as I started researching this space in preparation, I found that there's just a very wide variety of tools. And I, I do apologize in advance if, uh, if I didn't give your particular one the attention that it deserves here. Uh, at maluk.com, you'll find an, an FTP, secure FTP, and WebDAV gateway to S3. You can use this to, to push your data to S3 th through an FTP command. This might be useful if you already are using FTP to transfer backup files within your organization and you would like a, a straightforward way to use that existing backup process and, and push the data to the cloud through FTP. This is currently run as a service, but I have been in communication with the author of this service. Um, he tells me that at some point he proposes to make this available as an Amazon machine image so you could run it on your own Amazon EC2 instance as well. So at this point, all the options that we discussed were primarily focused at starting out on-premises and getting your data up to the cloud. Let's take a look at a couple of AWS-specific options that are more relevant if you already have your data stored in AWS. The first thing I should mention is that everything that we talked about so far still applies. If you wanted to use tar and S3 curl to move data from your EC2 server to S3, that's totally, totally acceptable. That'll work just fine. And in fact, you'll, because you're running internal to AWS, you're going to have very, very low latency between EC2 and S3. It's going to be run, the data transfer will run even faster. 
and there is no charge to transfer data between EC2 and S3 within the same region. However, as we'll see, the cloud adds some additional options. We're going to talk a lot about EBS snapshot backups, and we'll mention in passing the RDS snapshot backups as well. Let's quickly review what an EBS, or Elastic Block Store Volume, is all about. EBS is a, a network storage system for EC2 instances. You create EBS volumes that can be anywhere in size from one gigabyte to one terabyte, and you always do that in a particular AWS availability zone. After you create the volume, you attach it to an EC2 instance. Before the first time you use it, you're going to run MKFS on it to create a file system. And then you, you mount it and you start storing files on there. Once you have this volume in place and you're using it, you could use any of the traditional backup options that we've already discussed. You could, you could actually, if you want to, tar all the files off of an EBS volume and then S3 curl those over to S3. On the other hand, EBS gives you a, a really nice and convenient, easy to use snapshot mechanism that we'll talk about in, in just a little bit. I'd also like to mention that the, the annual failure rate for EBS volumes is, is, um, is planned at between 0.1 and 0.5% versus about 4% annually for commodity hardware. So EBS by itself is giving you a, a more reliable storage vehicle than a commodity hard drive. However, it's still useful to, to make backups. Super, super easy to go into the AWS console and create an EBS snapshot. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a list of the, the snapshot of the, of the EBS volumes that I have in my account. I simply right click on a particular volume. I choose create snapshot. Dialog pops up. I can give my snapshot a name and a description. I hit the yes button and then EBS will create a snapshot of the volume state as it existed at that time. I can then go back to the volumes list inside my console, and I can see a complete list of all the snapshots that I've created. I can sort that, I can filter it, I can very, very easily locate uh, any of the, the backups that I have created. If I need to do a restore, I go to that list, I right click on a snapshot, and I simply say, create volume from snapshot. I can create that volume in any of the availability zones in the AWS region where it resides. And I do need to know the size of the original volume so I can create a replacement volume of an appropriate size to restore to. As a side note, this actually, the, the snapshot and restore model is also good if you created a, a volume, put so many files on there it started to get full and you say, I need some more space. So you, you snapshot your volume, um, create a new larger volume, restore to that volume, and then you simply expand the file system. The, the, the command to do that will be specific to whatever file system type you happen to be running. And al almost all the Linux file systems now have the ability to expand to, to fill extra space at the end of the device. So the, the EBS volume restore can also be used um, for that purpose. OK, so we talked earlier about this idea of taking consistent snapshots. And uh, Eric Hammond, who's done some really awesome work for the AWS community, has put together a, a nice script called EC2 Consistent Snapshot. This takes care of lo a lot of the consistency uh, operations that we talked about earlier. It will help you to freeze your file system, lock the databases, take the snapshot, unlock the databases, and unfreeze the file system. You can find this at elastic.com. And this one takes care of all the interesting little details that come about when you are attempting to, to do high quality, consistent snapshots of your EBS volumes. You might also think about doing some scheduled backups. And so if, if you're familiar with, with, uh, with the cron command, you could, you could install the EC2 command line tools on your servers. And then you would simply launch the EC2 create snapshot tool at the point when you need to create uh, volume, uh, backups of particular volumes. To do this, you need to configure AWS credentials on your, your server. And when you run the command, you simply give the, the dash D argument to give a description of the volume. And you then give it the actual uh, identity of the volume. There are other EC2 commands that will do things like give you a list of all the volumes attached to a server. A more sophisticated script could iterate through all the volumes attached to a server and then make decisions based on the, the, the name or other metadata about each volume when 
and even if you want to take snapshots of the particular volumes. Also on the scheduling side, there are some third-party tools that make it possible for you to schedule backups. Uh, one that I've taken a look at is called Schedly. With Schedly, you can simply create an account, you provide it with your AWS credentials, and you can then schedule backups. You, you can create a, a, an action. You can tell it which volumes you'd like to backup, which backup schedule, which tags you'd like to add to the backup volumes, and so forth. So in, in the last uh, 35 minutes or so, we, we've taken an amazingly fast trip through a number of different ways to, to do backups. And in the interest of time, and because I wanted to leave some time for, for questions, there, there's a number of things we didn't cover. We didn't talk about doing uh, backup of databases. We didn't talk about using, for example, the relational database service to backup your MySQL or your Oracle instances. We just talked about EBS. Um, th there's also things we'll, we can talk about in the future about backing up Oracle um, RMAN or backing up MySQL. And uh, we could also talk about the uh, AWS Storage Gateway. Um, looks like we have time for just a, a couple of questions, so let's, let's pull those up and uh, see how we're doing. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the first question here. It, the, the first question is uh, from Ephraim, and he asks, what does 11 nines of durability mean? Um, is it that I only lose 0.3 milliseconds of data a year? Um, the, the, Ephraim, the, the way this works is that um, when, when we store data in S3, we automatically make multiple copies of that data, and then the, the S3 infrastructure is automatically managing the the integrity of that data. It is always making sure that, that any particular devices where your data is stored, that, those data, that the data is up to date, it's running checksums across the data. If at any point S3 detects that there are uh, not enough copies of your data, it will automatically make additional replicas of your information. It's doing this dynamically, transparently, behind the scenes. What the 11 nines of durability means, if you were to store 10,000 objects in Amazon S3, the expectation, based on all the, the observations, the, the math that we've done, we would expect to lose one object about every 10 million years. So that's, that's the, the math and the logic between the 11 nines of durability. Okay, so uh, Diego asks about, uh, he says S3 command and S3 curl are great for backups on Linux, but they don't deal with transfers of huge numbers of, of small fa files by using multi-threading or parallel uploading. Um, I don't happen to know of any utilities that, that, that are able to do multi-threading or, or parallel uploading. It's definitely something I would uh, be happy to research, and in a, a future version of this webinar, we, we can cover some advanced features like that. Um, let's see, David is asking about, uh, does S3 Fuse support multi-push? I'm actually not aware of that. Um, again, something we should investigate for, for, for the future. Let's see. Okay, a couple questions about sharing presentations, which we will definitely do. And then um, Chris asks if we will do a webinar that's specific to RDS and Oracle. I don't have a specific plan to do that, but uh, based on the interest that we have seen, I, I would say that's a fairly likely thing for us to do. Bruno asks about, what do you think about using S3FS or any other tool to mount S3 as a file system in a Linux box? So I've, I haven't uh, accumulated a lot of experience using this. I, I set it up in order to, to test it out for the purposes of this webinar. My sense was that it seemed to be a fairly mature piece of code. It, it's gone through a number of versions. It seemed to have a, a fairly active user and development community. The, the one thing that you do need to worry about when you start to see people saying, let's turn S3 into a file system, is that at, at the very, very detailed level, you're not going to see the, sa the same exact file system semantics that you would get from a local file system. Um, for example, when you think about the way that, that a remote file system has to modify an object, it's going to have to download the entire object, overwrite a portion of it, and then upload the modified version back up to S3. That, so, so anything that's going to be doing random access that's, uh, that's doing, uh, let's say, kind of random writes to the middle of a file, I don't know exactly how well that would perform under a, a remote file system based model. 
generally with remote file systems, there's also going to be some, some differences in the, at the POSIX level of things like locking and so forth. Oh, okay. We actually got an, an FYI from David who says uh, S3FS does support multi-part upload above 20 megabytes and up to 64 gigabytes. So, so thank you, David, for contributing that. That's, that's great to know. Okay, um, Advenus asks, uh, when an EBS snapshot is created, is it actually stored on S3? Yes, that is the case. When, when you do create the snapshots, those snapshots do end up on S3, and they have the same level of, of durability as, as we've talked about for S3. Okay, now we have a question uh, regarding S3 security. Okay, so we, we covered a little bit of security at the, at the beginning. Let, let me talk to you in, about that in a little bit more detail. When you transfer data from your on-premises uh, storage up to S3, you have the option to send it to us via an encrypted um, SSL connection to protect the data in transit. Once your data is resident on S3, you have the option to enable server-side encryption with S3 automatically managing the encryption keys for you. When you put new objects into S3, they are private to your account by default. Your AWS account is the only one with permission to read or write those objects. For finer grain control, S3 gives you something called an ACL, an access control list. And with the ACLs, you can very selectively grant additional permission to others. For example, if you're using S3 to store um, some like open source project and you want to enable downloads, you could retain the permission to upload data to S3, but you could allow public reads of that particular item in S3. And you can do this at the individual item level. We do have a security center on our site, and we also have a security white papers available that, that give you a lot more information about the various options and procedures and certifications and so forth uh, relative to S3 security and AWS security in general. All right, Stephen asks, he says, for guests in, S in EC2, can S3 serve as a target for traditional backup clients such as TSM, or would we need to write to EBS first? So Stephen, you are totally, totally welcome to use to host your data on EC2 and then use your, your existing backup model to push your data up to S3. All right, uh, Pradeep asks, can S3 or EBS be used to support NFS mounts for multiple instances without too much trouble? Um, yes, you can do that. In fact, th there are some tools I've seen that will automatically set up NFS mounts across multiple instances. Uh, for example, MIT has a project called Star Cluster that makes it easy to set up a, a cluster of EC2 instances running in AWS. If you, if you find the star cluster script, you can, you can use that as a basis for setting up NFS. Uh, I know that the last time I, I ran that, it automatically set up a, a master NFS volume and then shared that out to all of the, uh, uh, the, child, the child servers. Okay, um, one more question from, from Bruno. He says, what about using our own keys to do server-side encryption instead of using AWS keys? Uh, we, we've had a few requests for this, and it's something we're still collecting some customer data on want to kind of better understand the use cases and the requirements that you'd have on a, on a, a customer supplied key management facility. Uh, Bruno, if you want to email us, we'd be very happy to, to uh, take your requirements into account, pass those along to the team for, for planning purposes. Okay, another question from Bruno. This has been a great series of questions. I, I really appreciate all these awesome questions you are, you're all sending here. So Bruno asks, what about storing the same backup on multiple AWS regions? So Bruno, when you store data in a particular AWS region, it is local to that region, and we never ever copy it between regions uh, without your explicit command. If you wanted to put some scripts together to replicate data from, let's say, from the US East region to the Europe region, it, it, it would be very simple to write uh, an S3 script to, to do that replication from S3 bucket to bucket. We don't currently have any facilities to do that automatically or programmatically for you, that would be a, a relatively straightforward application to build using the S3 APIs. Okay, another question from Diego. So Diego asks, does Amazon S3 impose some limits on the bandwidth throughput for uploading or downloading files from S3? There re are really no built-in limits to S3. We do, we do know that when customers start to do extremely heavy get and puts to buckets, we do have some guidelines for best practices as far as the ways that they choose the, the key names for S3. Uh, generally, when you get to the, the point when you're doing hundreds of gets or hundreds of puts per second to an individual bucket, we, we would ask you to take a look at our guidelines in order to get the best performance from S3. 
Uh, we, we currently process about 500,000 operations per second on S3, so it, it's, a, it's a very, very busy service. So, so the, basically, net-net, uh, there are no intrinsic limits, either, either on the, the number of gets or puts or the amount of bandwidth. We, we have extremely well-connected data centers, and there, there shouldn't be any, any you know, reasonable level of data transfer we, we can't, uh, can't sustain. All right, uh, let's see. Mauricio says, what do you think about free NAS-like solutions using EBS volumes? Um, oops, just scrolled away here. Would that be a strong solution for avoiding snapshots? Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with that. It's something I'd be happy to take a look at for a future version of our webinar. Gerald asks about, what do you think of mounting an S3FS on a Linux server and doing our sync? Don't see any reason why that wouldn't work, and uh, I think that would actually be a, a pretty reasonable way to, to, to sync data up to S3 as well. And then Charlie asks, he says, will the Amazon Linux AMI be changed to have an XFS formatted disk in the future to allow easier disk-free snapshot usage? A great question and one that I'll be happy to pass along to the Amazon Linux AMI team at the end of our webinar. I think that just about wraps things up. Haven't seen any new questions come in for a, a minute or two. Uh, we really, really appreciate your, your time and your, your questions. Um, hope this was a, a good use of, of your time. A uh, couple, couple things to remember. The cloud's going to make your, your backup and your recovery very easy. You can get started for pennies per month, as, as we saw. The cloud's going to be able to scale and to accommodate all of your data. And you're going to retain visibility and control of, of your data. Here's a number of, of links you can visit to get some additional information. We have a, a site dedicated to providing you information about AWS backups. We will make these slides available on our SlideShare account. The recording of this webinar will, will show up in our, our webinars page. And we have a number of interesting videos for you. The AWS website at awsamazon.com. The AWS blog is at aws.typepad.com. And we have a number of interesting white papers for you as well. Once again, I really appreciate your time, taking the time to, to listen and look forward to hearing back from you after you've used S3 to do your backups. Thanks for watching.